Hello, everyone. This is Martin Pitella for Life Enthusiast Podcast. And today with me, my long, long term collaborator, Scott Patton. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martin. Happy to be here. Good to see you again. Merry Christmas, everybody. This is the annual Martin and Scott. Let's review the year behind us and let's make some predictions for the year ahead of us. Let's try. Yes. Let's try. I am feeling somewhat somber at this stage because we are really in the last four weeks of Pluto in Capricorn. Yay. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> hey, listen, what's coming is going to be really interesting. But anyway, we'll get to that. That'd be worse. <laughs> Famous so, last words, right? Yeah. My my year this year has been quite challenging personally in multiple ways. Like so many things have just pushed on my buttons in so many ways. Mm. How about you? Um, Not so much? No, not so much, actually. Um when you said this was the last four weeks of of Pluto, wherever it is, um, I I was thinking, you know, what popped in my head was, thank goodness, because it does feel like the old um, paradigms are sort of crumbling apart. Yep. You know, being in Canada uh, and Canadian. You know, it just seems like Justin Trudeau has done some awful, awful things in the last few years, yet his and, not yet, and it just feels like everything around him is crumbling, like nobody really believes him anymore. And I shouldn't say nobody, because there's definitely, you know, a, a, a group that is never going to change. But um, it just feels like we're getting close to the end of the dark night. <laughs> Oh, yeah, he is definitely going to be facing the consequences of whatever. You know, as you sow, that's what you'll reap, right? Yes. Um, and and when you when you sow, sow distrust and contempt and um, entitlement and uh, I don't know what all he has, he, he represents so well. The uh, the spoiled bread and titled people. Yes. Right. Yeah, and I really feel like their uh, their time is coming to an end. And well, <laughs> let, let's let's just to define, you know, the, this theme being astrology. Pluto is a transformer. When whatever it touches, it transforms, but not in a nice way. It right. leaves behind ashes from which the new crop will grow. Yeah. And that's the way I see it. Like in Canada, it's like we've had these massive wildfires that have destroyed, you know, oh. huge masses of land. And, uh, of course, the ash is now on the ground and fertilizing. And Yep. There's, and... there's new forest. There's a new forest rising right on the floor of the burnt one. That's right. And that I think is the same with Canadian society. You know, yeah. he's he's burnt it to the ground and people don't trust. And and I mean, even the even the judges are like you're guilty, right? Of all these different things that are just poor mm -hmm. poor morals, right? Poor ethics. Yeah. And uh, and hopefully um you know, like hopefully from there we we have a, a regrowth as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so and, yeah, the, the revisiting, right? We were we were dealing with uh, cultural superstructures in, yes. in the Capricorn, uh, religious, right? The people who run churches and how we think of religion, and look at all the things that have come up from below how the powerful people treat everyone especially children right right all this immorality of the people in power yes yeah all of yeah. that is in the light now right like nobody that is paying attention trusts these people anymore right yeah 
and you're seeing that in our wars where there's you know before it was oh we're you know behind all these different groups that were going to war and now we're seeing a fra I, th I think a fracture would be the better way to put it where it's like you guys are just sending all this money so it gets laundered and back into your pocket somehow <laughs> yeah oh yeah 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 the uh, we would call it the culture of supremacy right the, yeah. the entitled people who are somehow better than the rest the one percent somehow being able to uh, suck all the resources onto them or toward themselves yeah. and get away with it well <laughs> that's about to change yes I'll, big I'll, time I'll, I'll tell you why okay uh, well let, let me just say this way when Pluto comes into Aquarius, it's bringing these transformative energies into information technology, into dealing with data, dealing with science and systems of power. These are the structures, mm -hmm. right? So Aquarius as such is concerned with the collective people together. And this is going to go from starting January 21, so we're four weeks from the day we're recording it, and uh, it's going to run until uh, 2044, 20 years. Oh, wow. So this is going to be a 20-year burn, and, uh, well, uh, to illustrate, last time Pluto was in Aquarius was 1778, to 1798. Wow. Think Bastille Day in France. Think American Revolution. Think Industrial Revolution took off completely, right? Like in yeah. 1790s is the beginning of the steam engine coming in and completely changing everything. Like we used to have a uh, agrarian society. Yes. Right, like b before 1780, uh, you had uh, farmers. What, well, first of all, all the all the um, I don't know what you call them, the landowners, the the people who you'd call highborn. I don't know. Do you have a word for lords, it? Lords, the lords and ladies. You had the lords, right? They had uh, they had villages and people on it, and everybody worked for them, and they were born into wealth. Right. Well, and then comes the Industrial Revolution and the agrarian order of things totally changes. changes. Yeah, because you had you had you needed the people on the land because there was no mass agricultural production. And then it changed to tractors and combines and all this stuff. So instead of having like talking to my aunts and uncles, you know, they said, oh, the, you know, the countryside was full of people. And, you know, because... Yeah, because needed, it was manual, manually. It was manual. And then all of a sudden you had tractors and you you needed one person to do, you know, 20 fields instead of 200. And and it just totally changed and became yeah. empty. So yeah, was... we used to have, we used to have 90% of the population employed in the raising of the food. Yeah. And then it went down to 30% about 100 years later. And now, which is 200 years later, it's down to two or three percent of population mm -hmm. is involved in growing food in an industrialized society. Yeah. So expect this revolution to take place now in manufacturing. Well, like, we have this in this rise of AI. Right. It's, you know, it. I think it was sort of fermenting under the. You know, for a long, long time, and then the technology in terms of the power of computers got to a certain level and then the programming got to a certain level and now it's in the beginnings because we just can't imagine just like like you were saying when before the you know 10 years before the industrial revolution you know did anyone imagine tractors you know only 100 years later only 100 years yeah. later or automatic automatic well it started with the steam engine right so they had steam powered right. threshers and then they had and locomotion, right? You right, yeah. The railway having a horse carry everything across the country. You had these trains that would carry it across the country. Didn't need rest. Didn't need hay. Didn't poop. 
and uh, yeah, you know, so we're in in tech in the IT world, you know, in the internet, we're at that point where it's not hard to imagine, and in fact, we're kind of there already, where you just talk to your computer, right? Oh, I yeah. dictate to my computer far more now than I did even a year ago, mm -hmm. and I'm moving more towards that. And mm -hmm. um, with and this course, AI, we can just see this huge potential, uh, and with no idea of what it'll actually look like when we get there, right? Is it going to be Skynet, yeah. or is it going to be Jet Jetson, you know, the Jetsons family, yes. cartoon, right? Well, and so for that, I bring you the uh, the French Revolution, right? In which year was that? 1789, which was right in the middle of the 20-year run. Right. When, I mean, the, the, the French, I don't know, Marie Antoinette. Yeah, let them eat cake. <laughs> yeah, let them eat cake. If there's not enough bread, let them eat cake. Well, so this sort of thinking, right, the 99% uh, uh, will likely rise. So the people who are currently enjoying these phenomenal benefits of this field being tilted toward toward them, right? Like you have these one percenters, the uh, the rich families, the Rockefeller, Carnegie, and uh, Rothschild and Queens. Well, those two, but uh, and the Vatican and the the current structure of power as it exists. I expect that it will not survive the next 20 years. Interesting. Well, and you know, when you brought up Mary Antoinette, you reminded me of Prime Minister Trudeau of Canada, who uh, who basically and famously said, you know, should we tolerate these people? Yeah. And these people being people that disagreed with him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he, he wishes everyone to have uh, human rights and freedom. Uh, right of expression except those that disagree with him right right yeah and you know i mean if there he is he is this century's mary antoinette because <laughs> yes you know we had it, all these truckers and all these other people that that, that showed him how happened. yeah yeah go ahead yeah i mean there was it was non-violence and i think that's you know one of the things that is really interesting to me is the this um ruling class that you've described so well it knows what to do with violent protesters it does not know what to do with passive or non-violent protesters mm -hmm. a la gandhi you know yeah. really and Correct. i could never understand that right yeah. until and because i would look at what happened in india and you know these indians would just stand there and the british would beat them and there was yeah. never any violence until finally the British gave up and left because they couldn't they couldn't deal with it. And right. this the the trucker protest was incredibly nonviolent. And even and and the the elite tried to incite violence. You know, they trampled on this poor little old uh handicapped lady in a wheelchair, right? Yes, and oh yeah, with everyone horse. went to protect her and it became this symbol of the of the evil of the government and they didn't know what to do about it, right? And and so it, it's just really interesting to me that you know violence begets violence, right? Peace begets yeah. peace. You reap what you sow, you sow love, you get love, and the people that are full of hate and you know think other people are just like not non-human i'll put it that way whether the, regardless of color now it does has nothing to do with color it used no. to be color now it's no it's like them and us and and if you don't uh, do what we say then you're them and you should be you know yeah hung well i would say it this way the power of the slave is vested in his willingness to lay down tools right Right. I mean, this is the, the power of the strike. I mean, that the main changes of the 20th century came when during the Industrial Revolution, workers decided to get together and uh, said, no, strike. We, we strike. You don't get to eat. Right. These one percenters or whoever entitled people are, people are who have uh, five houses and uh, security detail and uh, endless whatever, 
they all depend depend on the people that work for them delivering the service right at and some when they stop then they're just they have the same problem everybody else does right so that's that is likely to come i i would say it, you know dismant dismantling of social hierarchies is mm. one of the themes so the and we've seen that in the business world because the business world used to be a very steep pyramid. You had the president at the top, and then you had all these layers of supervision. And then at the bottom, you had the people that actually did all the work. Yep. And it has become, over the last 20 years, flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter. Yeah. Yeah. And the pool of secretaries has gone away because you, you just said it. You're talking to your computer. You don't have a secretary. Yeah. And you don't need as many people to... You don't need as many people to manage other people as you used to as well, because you you can now communicate via, like, say, email to, uh, you know, 100 people or 1,000 people where before you needed to tell your supervisor, you know, your first level supervisor to your second level, to your third level, to your fourth level. Yep. And we saw that in the grocery world, by the way, like there used to be seven divisions uh, in Safeway had seven divisions in Western Canada. Each one had its own controller, accounting manager, assistant accounting manager, accounting team. Now they have one, right? Yep. So Try. it used to be this big and now it's, you know, it's like this. It's same with the, with management, you know, you used to need to, you have a store manager, but then there was districts and they had district managers and yep. they had divisions right. and division right. managers and right. the whole thing had a manager. Yeah. And so it's all, all of that has shrunk and the organization has become flatter Flattering. and flatter. Flattening. Not so and, much in government. So I well, and I, so this is a really important point you're bringing up, because I personally believe that the representative democracy has completely outlived its purpose. Mm, in the following, well, there's manner. a radical thought. Let's hear more. Yeah, in the following manner, uh, money in politics allows you to fund the re-election of a representative. Yes. Right? So because you have a representative, a person that is elected to speak on your behalf, you think that you have democracy, you think that you have a voice there. But in fact, that voice has been purchased by money. Right. And so that voice is not really speaking for you. It's speaking for the money that had helped that voice to be elected and brought into the body of of decisions of politics, right? So that's that's the concept. Representative democracy is supposed to represent me, but it doesn't represent me. It only represents those who have financed that person to be there. Right. So we now have the technology, which is called blockchain, that allows us to track any voice, any decision, any vote completely to its completion. And so we can now make decisions and vote on things that we are interested in or involved in. So I can easily right. visualize a system by which we have meritocracy rather than democracy. Meritocracy means that people who are actually competent in doing something as opposed to elected to be doing something, doing what needs to be done. Hmm. I would say that's the opposite of what we have right now, because well, it yeah. seems like the people without merit are the ones making a lot of decisions, particularly over the last three years, uh, based totally on how they can uh, feather their nest, if I can put it that way. That's exactly what I'm talking about. And the meritocracy is what I expect will replace this current system. Boy, there's going to be a lot of people fighting tooth and nail to make sure that doesn't happen, which is where Pluto comes in, right? Yeah, you know, the incumbent, as in the one who is currently at the trough, is always going to resist the change. Yes. Yes. I mean, it, it, even in technology, right? A, com a company that currently is enjoying the benefits and the spoils of having the... Um, I don't know what the invention that's currently popular is going to defend its territory. You know, this is really interesting what you're talking about of this massive change that Pluto is bringing in, because one of the changes that's occurring in the pop culture arena 
is Superman and Mickey Mouse are about to become public domain. Oh, okay. Yeah. And of course, what they say is, is that, you know, the version of Superman in the comics right now is copywritten by DC Comics. Yeah. But the version that, you know, in Superman number one in 1939 or whenever it was that it came out is not. So you can't really do a story about today's Superman, but you can do stories about the 1939 Superman. He could just leap over tall buildings. He couldn't fly out into space sort of thing, right? Yes. And uh, uh, so, and then Mickey Mouse, I was just shocked because I, I never thought Disney would ever, you know, but it, it was an article I was reading, like both of those. And I'm sure that, you know, Captain American and there's a whole pile of other people that are about to enter the, the public domain. And you see it already with like Frankenstein and Thor and, and, and those types of characters, which have, anyway, it's just really interesting that all of a sudden you could have 10 Superman comics on the stand, only one of which is published by DC Comics. And you could have a movie about Mickey Mouse that is not by uh, Disney, which is uh -huh. just, um, you know, so I mean, there's this, this is massive social change because we, at the same time, with AI, you don't need, uh, you know, a half billion dollar studio to make a movie. People are, are, they're not great at this point, but the technology is such that you can see in the next few years that I'll be able to sit down and plot out my story and then give it to AI and then edit it and make all the little changes. And the next thing you know, in a couple hours, I could very easily have a, a movie every bit as good as Pixar's. True. True. There is a movement in the computer programming called open source. Yes. And uh, the conversation was at Google where they were trying to figure out the AI and their market advantage. And what they found was that open source was beating them hands down. Yeah. And open source is essentially people working together just for the heck of it. Right. And so, for example, there is a new movement around uh, uh, a cyber coin or, or crypto coin, new currency, and uh, around the communication. And it's called Quartal. Q-O-R-T-A-L. Look it up. Quartal is phenomenal in the sense that it's true peer-to-peer, -peer, true liberation. Nobody owns you. No centralized power to rule over you. Cool. Which, and the, the code itself is in public domain. So it in the end, all the public domain stuff will win because it's not based on hierarchical. Instead, it's based on openness. Right. It's interesting you bring that up because that was a big conversation 20 years ago when Microsoft was first starting out. It was there was before it kind of became dominant. What was happening is exactly like you were describing. People were they had these computers, but they didn't have any programs and they were trying to figure out how to do the programs. And what would happen is. The, and I, I'll use the names of companies that we know, but th they probably weren't that involved in it. But, you know, the, the engineer at IBM would go on GitHub and he would start programming some sort of database sort of thing. And then the engineer at Microsoft would get on there and he would make his changes, you know, and they started working, all working together because they didn't want it. They didn't need to do it for the thing they were creating to be a product to be so, to be sold. They were doing it because they needed it for their business. So it's kind of like the accountant, right? He's, yeah. he's got to figure out these numbers and everything else, but he can't add. But the guy over there, he can add, but he can't figure out the numbers. So they were, and, and then just expand this to, you know, hundreds and hundreds of companies. So we needed something and I'm being paid to make it. But instead of just me sitting by myself and doing it, you had this open source community that was all contributing, not because they wanted to sell it, which is what we think of today, but because their company needed it, right? Yes. So there was this whole collaborative th thing going on, and it was kind of like, 
when the Microsoft came out with Word and they were selling it and this community was up in arms, like, no, you shouldn't be selling it. It should be free for everybody to use sort of thing, because mm -hmm. that's what we're doing here. And mm -hmm. not saying that Microsoft had anything to do with that. It probably didn't. But uh, and and over the last 20 years, Microsoft won. You know, all of these companies were making the programs mm -hmm. and selling the programs mm -hmm. and this open source people kind of, they didn't disappear because Linux and all, you know, other types of programs were, were all part of that world, but they kind of quietened down. Like there was an open source word type pro program. There was an open source Excel type program, yeah. but it was never popular because Microsoft with its uh, marketing power. Uh, marketing power and the fact that it ran the computers and everything else it just would you know you would use word because it was you know microsoft and everything else so yeah. but i can see this but, yeah. all starting to crumble because i don't use word anymore yeah. and let me let me try and read this line to you the structures of old and the purchase of the elite will be eyed with fresh contempt and the good for a few of us modality of capitalism will no longer suffice beautiful yeah so you know that you could call it the christian mode as in what would jesus do right yeah he was well i don't know if he ever was but he's said to have been very kind to people right so that's what's coming. The old preda predatory capitalism is about to be tested in a very, very serious way. And when you said that, what flew through my mind was uh, Jesus at the temple overturning tables, which would not be considered particularly kind, but as a representative of what we would now call the elite, absolutely fits the, the, the story. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's what I'm expecting is uh, in the following: Aquarius rules electricity, technology, uh, renewables. Um, so, the tech as we know it is about to change dramatically, and it, it's going to start flowing rather than into the pockets of the few, into the pockets of the many. Uh -huh. So I would even expect that the, the order of labor is going to change. It's possible that my grandchildren are going to not have to work in the sense of how we saw it. Because most of everything can be done with the automated technology. Or robotics. We've yeah. seen that in the building yeah. of cars, right? Yeah. So what happens then, Martin, if we don't have this thing that we're so used to called work? And I, I guess there's two paths, right? One is self-fulfillment, self-actualization. I am I am an amazing artist, but because I had to work as a plumber, I never had an opportunity to explore those talents. And the other side is uh, people that are just bored and they do drugs and... and uh, video games I, I guess you know like they just totally yeah. disconnect. yeah they are destructive in in terrible terrible ways to, to, towards themselves right right um i have not figured them out because there's just so much opportunity on this world to do something useful mm -hmm. i remember watching a video documentary from Haiti after they had a terrible earthquake there, a lot of destruction. And I was watching young, healthy looking men, 20 something year olds, sitting around on the ruins, waiting for someone to hire them and pay them money. Right. As if they couldn't just simply take wheelbarrows and uh, shovels and start fixing the mess. Right. That, that hours and days will go by all the same, whether yeah. you sit there waiting for someone to hire you or whether you just simply self-actualize and do stuff. Um, this is probably going to get sorted out somehow. I don't know how. It's possible that most people who want to be self-destructive will self-destruct. Yeah. Oh, well, and the other thing that can happen is, uh, you know, the family 
unit has been severely tested. And oh, so, damaged. you know, before, if mom didn't have to work and be distracted by all work, she'd be home, she'd be watching the kids. And if they're teenagers and the lawn's not mowed, she'd be grabbing them by the ear, get out there and get that done. And I think if, if we have this contraction of, uh, you know, need for really, labor, yeah. yeah, if we do, we don't have, we can have a proper family unit where people, I mean, even going back before that, the peasants in the field, right? There was the father, he, the field was right there. He didn't f drive 40 minutes to go to a field. He was right in the area <clears throat> and the kids aren't working. Like he'd have, he'd be like, get to work and whatever, yeah. however he did that probably was not pleasant, but the kids knew, you know, they got to go get the eggs and they got to pull the carrots and, and they got to do their thing. And it, and there was no, <clears throat> it was just the way it was. Right. Yes. So, you know, and, in my travels, what I've noticed is, um, you know, just it was just like a couple of weeks ago. I forget. Well, it would have been in Colombia. I'm watching this three-year-old, and the three-year-old is sitting on the on this on the sidewalk or in the yard, playing with something. You know, like it's not an iPhone, it's not an iPad, it's not electronic, and. And it's just like contently there, being there, like, and like, no, no, like, mommy, mommy, none of this crying is going on or anything <clears throat> for a significant period of time. And then I think of, you know, kids in the Western world. And if you take the iPad away from them, they cry until you give it back. Right. Or right. it's like, I'm bored. You've got to entertain me. And this kid was just like totally entertaining themselves, happy as content as could be, right? Yeah. And, you know, not needing constant supervision. And I think that's another thing that sort of happened in our society is we're so stressed out and so busy and everything else. We just look for some easy way. And the technology has given us that with these electronic games and devices. And so we've abdicated our parental responsibilities Mm -hmm. And if this whole thing changes and reverses, I can see that coming back. Whereas instead of having mobs of, of teenagers running rampant and doing graffiti and beating up other people, you've got the moms and the dads saying, no, that's not right. And smarten up and do this and do that. And then all of a sudden it totally, it's the pendulum swinging from anarchy back to, uh, yeah. to the family. Teamwork unit. perhaps. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is like we started out as a tribe. We, we are a team animal, right? We, we depend on one another. We are in, interdependent in our nature. We always have some that are good at something and not good at something else, right? Like, I mean, just the, the division of labor between genders, men are good at upper body strength and running and chasing. And women are better at patience and uh, gathering and uh, doing things that tend to be repetitive. It It's just the way the genetics are evolving, right? Anyway, so we used to have the tribe, then we had the village, then we had the family unit. It used to be three generations, right? Grandfathers uh, or grandparents, parents and children under right. one roof and i expect that something of the sort will come back i don't know how it's going to get organized or what will right. happen because of course we're no longer forced together through economics but i think we will come together because we want to right right absolutely yeah so i expect that you know there's something interesting about generations and it, I think it's somewhat related back to Pluto, because, um, for example, Pluto was in Leo in the years 1939 to 1958. Hmm. So this is the baby boomers, uh, pre-war and baby boomers, right? Like there were yeah. fewer people born between 39 and 45. And then from 45 to 58, there was just a large number of people being born. Me, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, me too, right? And so that was Pluto in Leo, and it brings a certain uh, uh, 
I don't know, mindset, perhaps uh, entitlement or, or at least self-sense of greatness, being willing to, to step up and contribute. And then the next generation, what comes after Leo? Um, Virgo, that would have been from 58 to about 71. And then 71 to 83, that's the Gen X, right? That's that's Libra. So they are, right. uh, they're like, I don't know, I guess, willing to put an end to disparities. Because mm -hmm. Libra, Libra people are always all about justice and stuff like that. Right. And then the next generation are people born between 83 and 95. That's Pluto and Scorpio. And then, then there's the Gen Z, 95 to 2009. So they are they are now starting to get into power, right? That's Pluto yeah. and Sagittarius. And that's extreme ideals, spirituality, and also conspiratorial thinking. Mm. So that's that's the distrust of authority in in a complete sense right particularly so, when the authority is proven to be untrustworthy yeah oh yeah of course uh, power corrupts right there's there's the problem with that yeah all, all i have to say is uh epstein whatever his name was didn't kill himself well that too he did not kill <laughs> himself but what's interesting about his client list how is it possible that his client list has not been released to the public? I mean, it has been released in the underworld. Like if you go looking for it, you'll find it. But how is it that it's not been actually on the news? Right. Well, it made the news that it's going to be released in 2024. And, uh, and here comes Pluto into Aquarius yeah. Yeah. saying, oh, yes. Yes, we will, and no, you don't. So, and of course, the people talking about it are well. I wonder what sort of massive war or distraction will occur at the same time they're trying to release the list to get people to look the other way. Yeah, I guess I would expect that the the alien story will get floated. <laughs> this is another one that I expect to come through. I really expect that during this next twenty years, the uh, the alien, and that technology will get released. I mean, this is what should be said, right? Uh, the American corporations, the military-industrial complex, the uh, Lockheed Martin and Grumman and uh, Boeing and whatever else, those large corporations that operate in dual way, right? They have the public right. side and they have the sequestered, undisclosed side. Oh, that's an interesting sidebar. I actually expect that the undisclosed, sequestered um, side of all the economy that exists will become known, will become revealed. But anyway, mm -hmm. that it's known, if you look for it, that these companies have replicated technology that is said to have come from out there, from off Earth, right. non-terrestrial technology. And one of them is known as the electrogravitic propulsion system, which is there is a way to tap the energy of the space in such way that you can balance gravity in such way that an object becomes weightless in oh, the sense okay. that you can control very easily where you point it. And where it goes. Up, down but also 360 degrees any direction you want. And because you're maintaining the momentum of gravity within that object, separate from the other, you can do accelerations that would otherwise kill all occupants. Like, right. Meaning this, a, a pilot of a fighter jet can stand maybe seven g's for a short amount of time right let's just say that you're going to do a dive and a pull-up right 
Like right. if you if you do three G's in a car, it's maximum. If you do seven G's, you lose your consciousness. Right, right. Right. But if you don't if you don't experience the G's, but you're moving that fast, then no problem. Yeah, you can change direction. So this is what has been puzzling the people who observe this, saying, well, these things pull off uh, spatial change that would require a 20 G force. It right. should make um, ground beef, in, <laughs> hamburger, anything inside, out of everything die. inside, right? Hmm. Well, that'll be exciting. Well, not only don't we need um, the um, petroleum fuel, we don't need roads. Go figure that. Yeah, talk about a change in your paradigm, right? Right. So when you mentioned Jetsons, that was the vision. That is exactly what they were doing. And in those years, in fact, it was the 1950s when they were doing the replication technology. It has been available all this time since right. the 1950s. So when in the early 60s you saw the Jetsons cartoons, uh, people moving around in these <laughs> vehicles that that is a reality that's that's not a cartoon very cool yeah well then let's just hope we don't also get the flintstones okay i don't understand like describe what you mean <laughs> well the flintstones were the stone age and he had a car and he had to run to get the car moving oh it was the pedal pedal rock wheels <laughs> Yeah, I thought it was a comedy. Yeah. Uh, All right. So anyway, that's that's my view of what I think is coming. Think again. The 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 thing for me is Bastille Day. Right. Which was ten years in from the beginning. I don't know how long it's going to take for us, but Bastille Day was where the peasants got pissed off, picked up their pitchforks, and marched on the uh, palace. And that was the end of it. And that was the end of it. Unfortunately, at the end of the age of Aquarius, well, the, the Pluto in Aquarius back then, in 1798, they went right back. Napoleon came to power, and uh, the next 15 years, they had the Napoleonic rules and Napoleonic wars, and they did just terribly. Right. So, hey, you're reminding me of Cromwell and King Charles. And we have the King Charles III now. And uh, they got rid of the monarchy for, I don't know, 20 years. And then they brought Charles II back and didn't change. Right. So it is possible that we will gain a lot. And um, I don't know. I mean, I have 20 years. In 20 years, I'll be 91. I would love to see that. I yeah. don't know if I will love seeing the next 20, which is when I'm 110. Right. If I am 110. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I don't know if I'll see 91. but The next 20 years will be very f interesting for sure. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to that. And so I'm, I'm here recording this with the uh, optimism of not knowing of how it's going to play out but with the hope that it's going to play out in a good way. Mm -hmm. Because the uh, love th thy neighbor as you would love yourself, the, yeah. the uh, you know, the what would Jesus do? I really want that to come clearly through in this new world of AI that's coming upon us, the new world of money as you know it, Right. It's going to burn up. They, I, I promise you money is going to burn up as we know it. The, this $40 trillion that the Federal Reserve has printed up to push into the world economy, it, that's about to blow up. I mean, this that's, that whole model is unsustainable. Yeah. So I can see changes in how money is. I can see changes in how internet is. Uh, manufacturing, food production. I, I, I can say it this way. Every industry that I have ever looked into in any uh, seriousness, I have found to be corrupt to the core, operating on false principles, 
operating on corrupted ideals, operating in on a tilted field that is feeding few rather than many. Yeah. yeah. At the expense of the consumer, the uh, owners of the technology are extracting wealth without regard for the people who are being extracted. Right. Yeah. And you're, you're seeing that change occur in Africa, actually. There's been five coups and they've thrown out presidents that are, in, in most of these cases, uh, beholden to France. Interestingly, we keep talking about uh, Bastille Day. Yeah. And they're saying, you know, why are we sending all of our riches to to France and to Europe and to Belgium to uh, instead of, and we're poor when yeah. we have all this wealth? Yeah. And the people are standing with the with the rebels and the new government, and uh, kicking them out. So we're seeing yeah. that transformation. Uh, and that if there's any place where you've got, uh, you know, massive poverty, child labor, and that sort of thing going on, mm -hmm. where you're wealthy, right? Like mm -hmm. it's unbelievable. So hopefully that will continue. Well, starting January 21, 2024, watch your back. Get together, form communities, form societies, get together with people, think about more moral. What is moral? What is, well, I said it, I'll say it again. What would Jesus do? Right. Think hard. Think hard and have a Merry Christmas. Thank you, Scott. This has been an interesting conversation. My pleasure, Martin. Great to be here. This is Martin Petella and Scott Patton for Life Enthusiast Podcast. All the best to you. Life-enthusiast.com and by phone, 866-543-3388.